Okay. Welcome to part four in uh, this kind of mini series on sexual health. Um, previous lectures, we've talked about sexually transmitted infections in sex ed, and now we're going to talk about contraception. Now, importantly, when we're talking about contraception, the goal here is prevention of pregnancy. Um, this is not a direct discussion of uh, methods for preventing sexually transmitted infections. Now, importantly, of course, pregnancy is a health issue. In fact, it's a very risky proposition. A lot of people die uh, or sustain major injuries or illness from pregnancy. So, um, as we go along and talk about various methods, uh, those that might be effective in preventing uh, sexually transmitted infections, we'll try to remember to mention that along the way. So, uh, quick introduction. Uh, fertility regulation, that is trying to uh, decide when to have children is a thousands year old technology. Some of the oldest uh, versions include things like lambskin condoms, which are still occasionally in use, not particularly effective, but uh, those kinds of barrier forms of contraception uh, have been used in the past. Um, highly effective forms of contraception are very recent development, and uh, so that's one of the things we'll talk about is the efficacy rates of these different kinds of contraception. Importantly, contraception was illegal in many parts of the world until relatively recently. Um, that's something to uh, understand about uh, contraception. It's certainly uh, looked down upon by a number of religious institutions. Um, so certainly Catholics are um, not to be using uh, contraception, uh, I think, except for, I believe, the rhythm method is the one that is approved for use uh, by that particular uh, religious group. Uh, in the United States, contraception was illegal in a number of states prior to 1965. The, the uh, landmark case of Griswold versus Connecticut, um, the United States Supreme Court uh, ruled that a fundamental right to privacy existed, and that included uh, the right to engage in uh, sexual contact uh, using contraceptive devices. And so uh, this is uh, what sprung forward, the right to privacy, and in particular as it relates to private conduct in our own homes. <clears throat> this is the case upon which um, other decisions were based, including Roe versus Wade. And so this fundamental right to privacy is founded uh, in these decisions. So that gets us then uh, to talking about different types of contraceptives. We'll talk about behavioral methods, barrier methods, and uh, hormonal methods. And we'll start with behavioral methods, um, certainly some of the least effective. Abstinence. Strictic, the strictest definition of abstinence is... No general contact of any sort. Definitions tend to vary widely. Certainly we got into uh, some of this discussion back in the 90s during the Clinton administration about um, what sexual relations meant. Um, certainly this is only effective if a strict definition is adopted. No, you know, no sex is no sex. There are sort of abstinence light versions, um, outer course. These are things that uh, do not include penile vaginal intercourse. Um, importantly to understand about these is sexually transmitted infections are still possible uh, through some of these methods. Uh, withdrawal or pulling out. This is where a man's going to remove his penis prior to ejaculation. It's provides some protection, but it's imperfect. Um, Pre-ejaculate includes um, sperm. And so really, um, this is a, a bit of a crapshoot, so to speak. Um, but certainly it's better than nothing. Um, biggest problem is not all men are particularly good at timing um, and controlling when this happens. So uh, again, it's a bit of uh, a draw. Um, perfect use rate is about 96% effective. Perfect use rate is almost impossible to obtain. Typical use, use rate is about 78% effective. So two out of 10 times this is going to result in pregnancy. So. That's um, not very good odds. Fertility awareness. Um, this has gotten to be a little bit different in the modern era. So these are methods that inform women of when they are most fertile so they can abstain or use barriers. Uh, temperature fluctuates across the menstrual cycle. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do this. The standard days method, which is counting the number of days from um, the last menstrual cycle. And the symptothermal method, which is tracking the body's temperature. <coughs> across um, the menstrual cycle. Uh, I believe if you look to my lectures on um, sexual behavior in my physiological psychology course on YouTube, you can find more information about 
these um, fluctuations. Typical use right here is about 76% effective. People lose track. It's not entirely accurate. Um, and if you're going to use this method, you probably want to add a, a um, plus or minus day on each end of what you think might be happening. Um, there are actually uh, apps to assist this. I've just looked for a few. I have no experience with any of these uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but Flow and Glow and Fertility Friend are uh, some of these that will help uh, track when you're more fertile and less fertile. These, of course, are used in two directions. They're used to help some people have children and help other people to avoid having children. Um, so that is fertility awareness. Uh, barrier methods. Uh, male condoms, the most commonly used of these. Thin latex or polyurethane barrier that covers the penis. Huge issue with this is um, increasing numbers of latex allergies. They're all polyurethane condoms. Um, typical use rate here is about 82%. So again, we're talking about two out of 10. Um, this is low because a lot of people make a lot of condom use errors. Plenty of websites to show you how to use a condom uh, effectively. Uh, Whitman Walker Clinic in Washington, DC has some great videos um, to watch for that. Um, uh, biggest issue is fit. Um, there are some websites that have um, far more size variations uh, so you can get a better fit. Uh, that's important because it needs to be comfortable if people are going to use them. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind. Female condoms. Uh, this is a polyurethane pouch that lines the interior of the vagina. Typically used right here is at about, again, 80% or so. Um, this is a great um, method uh, for women who are trying to take more control over what might be happening in sexual encounters. Uh, these can be used for anal sex as well. So these can be used um, for uh, anal sex um, in heterosexual and uh, homosexual encounters. So these work both uh, directions. Other barrier methods include spermicides. These are chemicals that kill or disable sperm. They come in a lot of uh, forms, foams, gels, that sort of thing. Not particularly effective, um, about 72% effective. Um, they're best if they're combined with other methods. So spermicide and a condom, spermicide and uh, um, other methods. Unfortunately, there does appear to be some link um, to increased risk of HIV infection. In fact, early on in the AIDS epidemic, uh, they encouraged us to use um, lubricants and uh, condoms that included a spermicide. And in fact, that turned out to be terrible advice because it does something to the uh, mucous membranes, which actually makes um, HIV infection more likely. Uh, there are also cervical barriers. These include diaphragms and cervical caps that both prevent sperm from entering the uterus. These are oftentimes used in combination with spermicides, um, as I say there. Their typical use rate is about 88%. Um, so certainly better than the spermicide on its own, um, but oftentimes these can be awkward or difficult to uh, use. You have to be pretty comfortable with your own body to use these. Um, uh, to get them uh, put in correctly. There were other versions of this. So the Today Sponge was one of these that was taken off the market um, because of um, toxic shock syndrome. So these can't be left in. That's one of the most important things. Um, and for those of you looking for a good giggle, there's a really great episode of the old uh, sitcom Seinfeld um, based entirely about the Today Sponge. So that gets us to hormonal methods, uh, really one of the most common methods in the U.S., certainly, uh, where we temporarily reduce fertility via the introduction of hormones into the female body. There are uh, male hormonal contraceptives coming on the market eventually. Uh, these would be long-term injections or implants that release progesterone and testosterone. Um, uh, they're in the works, uh, but we don't have those to talk about yet or their effectiveness. So... Um, hormonal methods are highly effective, but there's certainly potential for some hormonal side effects, including behavioral side effects, um, including things like alterations in perceived attractiveness, um, which is unique. There are a couple different methods. We'll start with the combined hormone methods. This is an estrogen and progestin combo. Uh, this comes in a pill patch ring. Uh, pills are available in a bunch of different formulations. Uh, typical use rate uh, effectiveness is at about 91%, mostly because people forget to take them. Um, it is a fairly pedantic um, method for uh, contraception. 
Now, one of the things that most uh, pill hormonal co um, contraceptive uh, methods include is a um, placebo period, uh, basically which uh, is coincides with the menstrual cycle uh, to allow a normal menstrual cycle. Uh, I've had students tell me, and you can look uh, for yourself, uh, that it's possible often to skip that and thereby either limit or eliminate your menstrual cycle uh, for a month or two. Talk with your doctor about it, and a lot of doctors are iffy about it, um, but certainly look into it um, on your own um, and talk with uh, others about it uh, and its effectiveness. Progestin-only methods include a progestin-only pill, uh, similar to the combined pill in action and effectiveness. This can include uh, an injection. Uh, one dose can provide months of fertility reduction. Typically, use rate here is about 94%. Um, you can also have an intrauterine device that includes a progestin-only method um, where the plastic uh, IUD is inserted into the uterus. This releases hormones for years on end. And this is one of the most effective. Typical use rate here is at, uh, greater than 99%. Um, I do want to stop for a second and talk about hormonal contraceptives because there are some health risks for some women. Um, certainly, uh, women who are on hormonal contraceptives should very, think very hard about um, not smoking because there are risks of blood clots and uh, other cardiovascular events. Um, there is, in the progestin plus estrogen pill, there is potential for people who are at risk for breast cancer for that estrogen supplementation to increase their breast cancer risk. Um, but you want to talk with your doctor about that and perhaps think about getting tested for um, the BRCA gene. I think that's really important to think about. So there are also implants that are available for these methods. It's are small rods that are inserted into the upper arm, and this, again, releases hormones for years, and the typical use rate here is greater than 99%. So the IUD and the rod implants are um, the sort of top methods for uh, their effectiveness in preventing uh, pregnancy. Um, so those are certainly some to think about. We're going to talk about Colorado's experiment with providing these for free um, here in just a moment. Uh, finally is the is emergency contraception. Sometimes this is referred to as the morning after pill. Um, this is a hormone till pill taken after uh, unprotected intercourse. Uh, it can be potentially effective up to five days afterwards and can reduce the risk of pregnancy by 89%. There's a lot of controversy about this particular form of contraception. Um, and that some people liken it to abortion. We'll leave that debate for somewhere else. Um, a number of states provide this without a prescription. Um, depending on your state, usually 16 or older, um, depending on your state and your age, uh, you may need parental consent. Um, so talk to your pharmacist uh, about that or just call, look up online. There's lots of ways to do this. Um, but if it's something that you need, it's, it's available. So here's sort of an overall use of Typical and perfect use, uh, effectiveness for these varieties of methods. Uh, no method, obviously, same effectiveness rate. About 15% of the time, you're not going to get pregnant. So those odds aren't particularly good for uh, avoiding pregnancy. Um, and I think it's best to focus on the typical use rate because very few people are capable of using um, perfect use methods. Um, so male condoms, even at their perfect use, or sorry, their typical use is 82%, even at perfect use, about 98%. Um, diaphragms, oftentimes, uh, the difficulty there is women aren't, aren't able to get them uh, implanted correctly and kind of won't know that until it's too late. Um, IUDs, contraceptive implants, and then male and female sterilization, which must be on the next slide, um, are the most effective in preventing pregnancy. Um, so these are the... Um, effectiveness rates of these. So sterilization, this is the most common form of birth control world, world, bleh, worldwide. Um, in women, generally tubal ligation, which is just simply a camp, clamping off in, uh, of fallopian tubes. People uh, refer to this as getting the tubes tied. Um, highly effective in preventing pregnancy. A vasectomy is the severing of the vas deferens in males. It will prevent sperm from reaching uh, ejaculate. Uh, very effective. And um, 
in preventing pregnancy. There are, there are occasional cases uh, where these uh, were not done effectively, um, but generally very effective. And so these are all, uh, of course, generally permanent. There is some success in reversing these, but in general, sterilization is highly effective. So virtually about 100% effective. So I wanted to talk for a minute about uh, Colorado's um, experiment in free long-term contraception that I really wish uh, every state would adopt and even Colorado would go back to adopting. Uh, so Colorado provided free three-year implants uh, over a period of five years, and this was um, in conjunction with a grant they received from a private foundation. Um, so over a period of five years, uh, they, anybody who wanted them uh, could get these three-year implants uh, for free. Teen birth rates were reduced 40%. Um, so massive reduction in teen birth rates. That's associated with um, improvements in health outcomes, educational outcomes, um, economic outcomes for those teens. So it's very important. Um, the number of abortions was reduced by over 1,000 a year. And so um, if you're somebody who is opposed to abortion, it's a perfectly valid viewpoint for you to have, um, then you really ought to be for these programs uh, because they were, they're very effective in reducing abortions. And importantly, from a cost savings perspective, for every dollar spent, $5.85 was saved in Medicaid costs. And so this was saving the state money. Um, unfortunately, it was not continued. Um, there was uh, some morality discussions that if people want to have sex, they should pay for it themselves and the state shouldn't be paying for it, despite the fact that spending the money saved money. This was an investment in uh, savings. And that was just Medicaid costs. If we think about those teenagers, that 40% reduction in teen pregnancy, those are individuals who um, continued their education, which means they had higher, edu higher incomes, which means that the state was getting more taxes from them. So this is a significant investment. And so I think providing this kind of free long-term contraception is a bit of a no-brainer um, as far as I'm concerned. So finally, um, just a quick overall look at what people are using. About 20% of women are on the pill. 20% um, or 17% female sterilization. 38% um, not using any at all. Um, and so all of these are entirely up to um, people to decide on their own. But it's important to get educated about what their efficacy rates are. Uh, and again, the final part of this uh, in terms of health is understanding why people choose these methods or don't choose these methods and oftentimes it has to do with education and understanding what they actually are Alrighty, we'll get into um, some discussions about why people do and don't use um, contraception and other safe sex methods in uh, the next lecture